Join internationally acclaimed overland expert Paul Marsh and award-winning journalist Gregory Simpson as they delve into all things responsible overlanding. From choosing the right vehicle, getting yourself prepared, getting your vehicle prepared, safety tips and much, much more. Only on responsible overlanding. And here we have the iconic troop. Uh -huh. So this has to be one of my favorite, favorite trucks. I guess it's, it is an iconic vehicle. I mean, if you, you know, the Defender is an iconic vehicle in many, many ways. The Troopy has lent itself to people all over the world building and living in and out of it. So the criteria for a truck like this really is when people come to me and they talk about going to go to South America for argument's sake. They're going to be high altitude, it's a lot more exposed. You're actually having to live in the vehicle as much as you can live out of the vehicle. Whereas with the other vehicles, you're not going to live in the vehicle. There's no space to climb inside these vehicles. Whereas the Trooper, you can build that. You can build a very nice setup inside where you can go in, you can cook in there if you had to, you can have water in there, you can you know, have a pop-up roof that pops up allowing you to stand up in the vehicle. So that space to be in the vehicle is actually quite critical, especially when you get to really remote places where you know, you go in South America, it is bitterly cold, you're high up at altitude, it's cold, it's blistery, you don't really want to be outside, you know, it's just not fun. So that's when the Troopy really comes into its own. It's, it's a vehicle that, you know, in Africa, do you need to live in the vehicle? Well, no, not really. I mean, we've got amazing weather. When it gets rain and, and wet, it's nice to have that option. You can climb in the vehicle. And you'll also find people's needs change. They might start out living, we're using a vehicle where they're living out and around it. And as they get older, they go, you know what? We want that much more comfort, you know? And there are people who do amazing conversions where they cut the, the troopy bodies, and especially in Germany, the guys cut the bodies back and they build wider bodies to give you a bit more space inside. Fantastic, at a price. That's, a big you know, price. At a big price. Do you ever so, see any sliders where you can actually make it wider and mechanically? You know, the, the, you, I have seen, uh, especially at the shows in Germany, guys do fantastic work. Anything like that, you've got to remember, once you're introducing parts that move, you're adding a complexity. So it's not so, great for African you know, roads. You kind of want to keep it simple. So the one thing I do like about the Troopy is you don't, if you don't cut the body, you've got the integrity and strength of a, a very well-made body. You might, we, we do cut the roofs off, and this one's going to have the roof cut off, and we're going to put a pop-up roof on here, and we're going to kit out the interior. I've got three more that we're busy with. But the reality is, you know, that is still a strong part of the vehicle. The integrity of the vehicle is still very strong. So we're not changing anything in that and and the troopy actually allows you to spread the load out, out the vehicle very nicely because you load you know inside the vehicle you've got storage down the left and right hand side you're putting you've got two tanks underneath which is fantastic so fuels underneath we put water tanks underneath so we are keeping the center of gravity very low and that does make a big difference so it's a lovely vehicle to drive very nice and balanced and I find that's probably one of my favorite favorite vehicles between that and the 80 series. And I want to show you the next vehicle. And in terms of off-road ability, can you differentiate them? I think they all work pretty well. I think the biggest gripe I have with the Toyota is where the axle in the front is wider than the back. That does hamper your off-road driving. You know, people do put spaces. I'm not a great fan of spaces because if you are going to fit spaces, you've got to use good quality spaces. And you need to, as a person owning the truck, take responsibility for that. I've seen spaces come loose where people haven't tightened them properly, they haven't serviced them, they forget to check them. So my advice to people, if you're going to use spaces, make sure they're really good quality. Make sure that the bolts and when they're fitted have got the correct Loctite on the bolts and they're properly torqued up and buy yourself a torque wrench and personally check the torque on those, those spaces and the rear wheels. Because any movement like that, any movement, the spacer comes loose and the wheel comes off, it's disastrous. Presumably you give your clients a checklist of do's and don'ts. I've got full checklists because for me it's very important. There's a daily checklist, then there's what to do weekly. And then if you're on a big expedition, monthly. So one of the daily checks that I have is to actually look under the car in case you can see any oil spots. Now, you know, we don't get big oil leaks on cruises. If there is an oil leak, then it's something you need to really look at. 
So I always say... Unlike another particular vehicle. That well, you know... This is like a little dog. I've, I've got a Scotty, <laughs> and, and uh, he, he goes and he likes to pee everywhere when we're walking him. And he's Facebooking. He's leaving his spot and his mark, you know, and some of the vehicles like to do that. They like to Facebook and leave their, their spots. You won't mention any names. And purchasing the Troopies, um, are you they, finding it harder to find them now that they're not, they're not made in South Africa? Yeah, you know, troopies, troopies aren't brought into South Africa anymore, and I think that's, for us as overlanders, it's, it's quite sad because it is a very, it's a niche market, and I understand Toyota's challenge. They're bringing it for a very, very small market. And of course, moving those trucks on is not, not as simple. So we do find them second hand. There are still a good number floating around, but you've got to work much harder. So when we find them, you are paying a premium to buy one. But you know what? It's still a good truck. And if that's the truck you need to build for your, for your circumstances, then look hard and we'll help you find a really good truck because it's important. And your checklist, getting, getting back to that? So the checklists, the checklists give people confidence because I think what named often happens with people when you're going on a trip and you're not familiar with your vehicle and you're not familiar with things, people become lazy for one, so they don't do the checks and that's when things can go wrong. You know, a vehicle, like anything, like your body, will give you a lot of early warning signs when something's going to go wrong. If it's a wheel bearing, you'll hear a noise. You know, and if you test it, you'll feel a bit of play. If there's an oil leak when you look underneath on in the morning and you see there's a drip of oil, tells you exactly where it is and then you can go and check and see how much oil. It doesn't mean to say you can't drive with an oil leak, it just means to say you, you need to monitor it and top it up if you can't fix it. So I had an oil leak, I drove right across America with it and one of my transfer boxes was leaking and uh, I, I just topped it up every two or three days. I knew how much oil to put in. It's fine. And then I got it to a workshop where we could fix it properly. So, you know, people go, why the 80 series? Okay, the 80 series in my mind was one of the trucks that Toyota put a lot of money into. You know, the, the, they came out with a turbo diesel motor, which was just fantastic. The 1HDT motor, the 12 valve, and then later the 24 valve motor. It's just a lovely, lovely, well-balanced truck. You haven't got any of the issues with the axles being wider and narrower. It's coil sprung all around, so it is a lot more comfortable. You do find, however, that it doesn't have quite the same space. It's much, it's much, the space is much the same as a 76 Land Cruiser. So you have got a load area in the back, you've got your middle area and you've got your front areas. But I do like it because it actually gives us so such a nice balance for two people to go and build a truck like this. They're certainly affordable. The diesels are harder to find right now. You have to look a lot harder. Uh, they are they're plenty in the world when you look around, but certainly in South Africa we find it a little bit tougher to find. There are heaps of petrols going for not a lot of money because people have bought them, they've used them, fuel's going up. Uh, it's a truck that they've been using for their own sort of trips. They haven't done big overland trips. So, you know, why not a petrol? There's nothing wrong with building a petrol. You need capacity to carry fuel. But you could save a lot of money on buying the base truck and have a lot of money to spend on fuel. So, you know, again, we're looking at budgets, we're looking at balances. It's uh, the, the fuel, the, the petrol motors were bulletproof. Getting into overlanding on a budget, this is probably the best way to get into it. It's one of the ways the this, this really works, you know, and a petrol 80 series is a, is, a good, is a good compromise, you know. I used to build the 90 series, the Prado, the short, the, the long wheelbase Prado. Uh, it's not as strong, it's got um, a steering rack as opposed to a steering box, it's got, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not quite as strong, but is it capable? Yeah, it's absolutely capable. It depends where people are going and what they're doing. Now that's a smaller car, that's a more compact car, you know, people the number of people we'd build that for just two people. But I do find that the 80 is a lot stronger. It's it's certainly, you know, in an accident you've got a really bulletproof car. You know, I've, I've had them roll, sadly, on, on a couple of trips where people have lost and rolled it. And we did put it back on its wheels and we did carry on driving the truck. So, you know, it, it is a safe vehicle. It hasn't got the latest of latest in, in all the latest features. But, you know, you've got a good solid truck. You can build it up. Uh, it's going to give you everything that you want in an overland vehicle. It doesn't take away what the other trucks offer, but it does give you a very comfortable drive. And you can divide it up very nicely, as we've shown before, where you can have a single seat, your fridge, you know, and you've got access to the, everything from the middle, from two doors. And then you've got your back area. 
which which is closed up. So balance, you know, you, you basically want to be able to say, can I have a vehicle that's giving me uh, what I need to travel? It is a, a well-balanced truck. It's well-packed. I can access everything, and it's going to take me on my trip. And and it doesn't make it less of a vehicle. It just means it does it suit your needs. And that's really where I distill with people. And uh, another nice feature of the 80 is the, the rear door is really convenient. No, they don't all come with this, but this, the ones that do come with these barn doors, yeah, it's lovely. It, it gives you that nice option to put, you know, um, on the yeah, side here, yeah, you've got drop down tables. So yeah. this is a complete, not complete, but it's a very different vibe to the, to, 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 to the 79 in terms of the back here. It is, and, and what you've got here is very similar to the build we did on the 105, okay? Um, and what we've got is the two water tanks, and then in between here, four, four ammo boxes go here. So spares, repairs, recovery tools. You've got a shelf up top that you can put stuff you don't use too often. You've got little cubby holes you can put some stuff in there, and then clothes bags can sit here. The table slides out of this, this aperture here. And then you're living out of the two drawers. So access to space, you know, food and all your cooking. So if this is my living, my table comes out. Chairs can either fold up small there or on top of the clothes bags. Because they're the first things you're going to take out and the last things you'll put back in. So it's a good setup. We fill the water from the outside. You've got two separate water tanks and they drain down. So the water tanks drain gravity feed. So no pumps, nice and again, simple, simple, less problems. You know, one water tank empties, you've got the other one. You can manage your water quite well. So I do like that sort of option. And I do like the plastic tanks because if I needed to, I could take that out and I could go and wash it out and clean it. You know, uh, Probably good to do every every. Oh, it is, so and you put stuff in the tanks, and you can wash them out. Yeah. You know, if you haven't used the tank, you can put something in, and you can drain it out. So you don't have to take it out. So 80 liters but is so that sufficient for for yeah, our For most people, 80 liters is fine. You know, if you're going to get to a point where you needed more, then take something like a Swiss military water bladder. Yeah. That's great. It's roll. You can roll it up when you need it. You can open it up. You can put extra water. You can put it on the floor behind the driver or passenger seat. Utilize that water. It's like the jerry can. And is the world, world becoming a smaller place where more fuel, more water available in remote places? I wouldn't say more available in remote places. I think people are actually accessing those remote places by being able to carry what they need. You know, um, certainly in mechanic stock route, that was quite unique because when we drove through there, you used to have dumps with uh, fuel dumps with with uh, you know drums. So the truck would come in and drop your drum off, and you would get your fuel. Now you can go to the Aboriginal village and you can get fuel from a proper big tank. So, you know, that's new in the last few years and that's fantastic. It's still very remote. You still need, you know, a thousand kilometer range. And then in thick sand, that can be quite difficult to achieve. That, that particular track had a very good range, didn't it? It had a good range and to be honest, most trips people do. You don't need a massive massive overextended range. But so a thousand Ks, man. A thousand Ks is a very nice range to have. 